The passage we chanted just now talks about having goodwill for beings that are born and those seeking birth. And the Buddha was an example of someone who had goodwill for both kinds of beings. Think about the way he taught body contemplation. It's good for you while you're alive, and if you die, it's good to keep in mind. It's a good practice to have done. While you're alive, it's, it's good for dealing with lust, for dealing with any kind of pride around your body. In the forest tradition, they teach two kinds of body contemplation. Basically, one is taking the body apart into its component parts, just visualizing the different parts one by one by one. Although they also recommend that you remember that the body, as you take it apart like this, is not made out of neat organs that you'd see in an anatomical diagram. Everything is all covered with blood. even the bones. And it's good to think about the fact that here is this human body, which the Buddha said is the most captivating, sensual object in the world. If you're looking for happiness in the, on the human plane, this is the central place. And yet what is it made out of? Its beauty goes only as deep as the skin. And even the skin itself, if you were to take it off. It's nothing to look at, it's just a pile of a pile of skin. And yet people are so infatuated with this. But the Buddha talked body contemplation as a way of getting out of that infatuation, protecting yourself not only from your defilements, but from other people's defilements. There are a lot of defilements that are built around your possessiveness around the body, your identification with the body, the idea that it's beautiful, the idea that it's better than other people's bodies. And we can do a lot of stupid and foolish and harmful things based on the defilements that come out of those beliefs. At the same time, if you're attached to how you look. There's always the question, do you still look good? Maybe you become an easy mark for other people. You want to look good in their eyes, and other people have designs on you. Think of that case of the, the nun going through the forest. A libertine comes up and talks to her about how lovely she is. He invites her to leave her life as a nun. And she says, what is there in this body that you find that you can look at at all? He says, your eyes. He goes on and on and on about her eyes. Now, fortunately, she had contemplated her body so that she was not infatuated with her eyes or any part of her body at all, which meant that she was immune to his designs. And you know, the day no more, she finally says, well, if you, want, if you like my eyes, here, here, have one. She plucks one out, gives it to him. Of course, that scares him. A woman that bold, a woman that, that brave, it backs off. So the fact that she had done this contemplation is what saved her. The story ends with her going to see the Buddha and just looking at him, the eye that she had plucked out grew back. Symbolic, of course, of the fact that her inner eyes were very clear. And because they were clear about the nature of the body, that's what saved her. The other contemplation that's popular in the forest tradition is of imagining your body as it decomposes. And John Fuhrman would often have students who, as they were meditating, would get a vision of themselves sitting in front of themselves. He'd say, okay, imagine it one year from now, two years, three, four, five, ten, twenty, thirty as you decay, 
And then when it dies, then one day after it's dead, two days, three, four, five, as it swells up, gets livid, breaks open, and then dries up. There's nothing left of bones. Then he would have them burn the bones. There's nothing but dust. And then he'd have them go from the dust back through the bones, through the various stages of decomposition, back to the body as it is in the present moment. To remind yourself that this is the fate of this body you're sitting in right now. That's what it's going to become. Again, that's to get rid of any sense of attachment around it. And this is where the teaching helps when you're passing away as well. Because this is John Fung noted. When he was teaching in Bangkok, he was teaching at a funeral monastery. And sometimes on a Saturday evening, when there are very few people coming to see him. On Saturdays, most people come in the middle of the day. So on a Saturday evening, he would walk around the monastery a bit and stretch his legs. And he'd come back and he'd say, you know, the number of people who die and they don't leave their bodies is really large. So you wonder what he saw. You can imagine people identifying themselves with their bodies, and then being pushed out, but not imagining anything else. And what it would be like to hang around a body as it decomposes. The whole purpose of this is to say, once you've left this body, you don't want to hang around. There's nothing here. But also remind you, if you go to any other body, this is the same thing is going to happen. The same 32 parts of the body, and then the death again. Decay, death, more decay. When will you have had enough? You should come back to the human realm. As I said, this is the most riveting central object in the human realm, the one that the most fantasizing goes on around. And you look at it, this is all you get. The parts that you like are right next to the parts that are disgusting. You can't have one without the other. So why take either? The purpose of this contemplation is to lift your sights, to say there must be a better way of finding happiness. Think of the Buddha's graduated discourse or a step-by-step -step discourse, talking about the virtue of generosity, the virtue of observing the precepts, the rewards in terms of sen sensual pleasures in the human realm and heavenly realms, but then the drawbacks of sensuality. He says even the degradation of sensuality. Think of all the degrading things you do for sensual pleasures. And even if you get the best sensual pleasures, you're going to have to lose them. And when you lose them, you fall down again, and you have to start being good again. And it just goes around and around and around. It goes nowhere. And what's the allure? Your perceptions of beauty around the body. Because the body is not the problem, it's your perceptions. You want to perceive it as beautiful. And this is the way we deal with sensual pleasures of all kinds. The real pleasure is in the embroidery, the fabrication around it, our thoughts of the kind of sensual pleasures we like or the sensual pleasures we've had. That's the free play of our imagination that keeps pulling us back. Because in that free play, you can lie to yourself, and the mind likes to lie to itself. Because after all, what are the actual, actual objects of sensual pleasure? They all have their drawbacks. But the mental image you can create around them, you can erase the drawbacks. You have all the fun you want, but it keeps pulling you back to these same old things, the same old disappointments. So here again we see the Buddha's compassion and goodwill for us in setting these teachings out. So we begin to see how the mind has been lying to itself. 
And you ask yourself, how much longer do you want to be taken in by your own lies? And John Mahabha was talking about doing body contemplation to the point where he would just look at a human body and immediately take it apart. And got so in his imagination it would fall apart on its own. He began to wonder, was he done with sensual desire? There had been no moment of insight that had told him, okay, this is the point where I'm stunned. So he started imagining a beautiful body. It took several days, but finally there was just a little bit of a stirring of liking that body. So the sensual desire was not gone. What to do now? He began to realize the issue was with the perception and the desires behind the perceptions. The fact that we want to lie to ourselves. So look into that desire. Right there, because that's the key to why we keep on suffering. We cling to the things that make us suffer. And this is why we like to lie to ourselves. So look at that. Try to figure that one out. And you have gone far in unlocking a lot of the, the secrets of the mind, the secrets of its ignorance and its craving. That's what the Buddha tells us out of his compassion. He's giving us this meditation as a protection. It's listed as one of the guardian meditations. So it's up to us to actually do the meditation to get that protection. And even though it's listed as a painful meditation topic, As he said, contemplation of the body leads to the deathless. So look into it to see how that's so.